hoppers. British Medicine Through Time, Renaissance Medicine, 1500-1700, Part 1. We will cover ideas of causes, the scientific revolution, prevention, treatment, care in hospitals, and the Great Plague of 1665. Important. The two C's, continuity and change. There will always be questions asking you to compare time periods, so make sure in each video you listen out for words to do with continuation or change. Ideas of causes Ideas largely remain the same. While scientists like Sydenham and Paracelsus rejected the theories of Galen and Hippocrates, most physicians and ordinary people still believed them, and even Charles II was diagnosed using the four humours. People also continue to use astrology, again believing that the alignment of Jupiter and Saturn in 1664 caused the Great Plague the following year. The miasma theory too continued to cloud people's mind. The Reformation in the mid-1500s was a key event because it undermined the church's power over ideas. This allowed some to challenge the traditional ideas in place, but many still stuck with what they knew and especially during times of crisis, fell on the old cause of God. There was some change, especially with the decline of the church's influence, which allowed scientific thinking to spread, including Sydenham's promotion of direct observation of patients for diagnosis, as well as discoveries into the digestive system, which meant urine charts were no longer used. Ultimately though, Despite improvements in anatomical knowledge and the ability to challenge traditional ideas, physicians and healers still used old ideas because they were respected by the people paying for the diagnosis and treatment. Plus, nobody could find the causes of disease, so new ideas were slow to spread. The Scientific Revolution This began in the 16th century, the 1500s, creating an age of logic, reasoning and experimentation, which had a significant impact on medical thinking. The Royal Society Founded in 1660, it was an institution that encouraged the scientific revolution. It had its own labs and equipment and was set up so that scientists could experiment and share ideas. Its motto translates to take nobody's word for it which really shows that its aims were to encourage debate and testing to prove ideas in order to further understanding of science. The Royal Society played a key part in publishing the developments from the scientific revolution, such as, in 1665, they published their first scientific journal, Philosophical Transactions, in which new discoveries were posted. In the same year, the member Richard Lower completed the first ever experimental blood transfusion. It was clearly important because in 1662, Charles II gave the society a royal charter, meaning it had support from high places even so early on. They proved their theories, enabling scientists to challenge ideas. Plus, scientists worked together to share research and ideas which encouraged more experimentation and inquiry. Did it really improve medicine? In the short term, despite the support from high places, it did little to improve medicine at the time, as the ideas could not spread so easily to ordinary people. But its long-term impact was significant, as it eventually helped improve medicine. It opened the doors to change. Prevention most ideas for preventing disease continued from the Middle Ages to the Renaissance, simply with slight changes, and here's the evidence. The practice of staying clean and healthy to avoid illness, using the regimen sanitatis, continued. The slight changes to this were that people began to avoid areas with disease and they checked the weather to do this using new instruments like thermometers. Also, bathing actually became less popular because of the spread of syphilis in bathhouses. 
People still believed in miasma and continued to wear sweet smelling herbs to counteract it. But now there was more of an effort to remove miasma from the air by doing things such as removing sewage, draining bogs and cleaning up rubbish from the streets. Superstitious ideas and prayer remain popular, but the idea of moderation spread, meaning people avoided excess of things like drinking or eating or being too lazy. Also, people began to suspect that if you are a weak child around birth, this explained later illness. So, was there progress when it came to prevention? Not really. Overall, it was partial progress and there was a large amount of continuity with simple alterations to traditional ideas. Treatment Whilst knowledge of the body was improving and scientific thoughts began to challenge traditional ones, treatment and prevention of disease in the Renaissance still showed significant continuity. Continuity Bleeding and purging This technique remained popular to rid the four humours. Even King Charles II was bled and purged. During the Great Plague, rhubarb was used to purge the bowels. Religion Many people believed the king's royal touch could cure because he was close to God due to his divine right. Over 92,000 people visited Charles II believing he could cure the skin disease scrofula. Supernatural The new London dispensary suggested magic to cure malaria, cut off hair, feed to birds in an egg and put inside a tree. During the Great Plague, magical charms continued to be used. There were slight changes of continued methods, such as with herbal remedies. These remained very popular because they were cheap, but they now matched the colour of the illness. For example, if you drank red wine, it was to cure smallpox. The exploration of the new world brought new herbs and spices like quinine. This was used by them to cure malaria and it worked. Also, books were used to spread ideas on herbal remedies. For example, Mary Doggett's scurvy cure. There were some complete changes, such as chemical cures. Alchemy, known as medical chemistry, became a new treatment inspired by Paracelsus. The College of Physicians suggested over 122 chemicals to treat 2,140 illnesses. Antimony was used to purge illness by encouraging sweating and sickness. However, people didn't understand it was poisonous. Mercury, also poisonous, was used for smallpox. A new idea was transference. This was the idea that an illness could be transferred from a patient to something else if you rubbed an object on it. For example, rubbing an onion on warts could transfer the wart onto the onion. So was there much progress? Like with prevention, progress in terms of treatment was only partial during this period, as again, there was a large amount of continuity and they were no closer to stopping or treating diseases effectively. Care and hospitals Some change had been made in hospital care since the Middle Ages. Rather than visiting hospitals for shelter and prayer, people now went for treatment of wounds or sickness. A patient in the 16th century could expect some form of treatment in a hospital, including a good diet of healthy foods, a visit from a physician who would observe and suggest treatment, and medication provided from the hospital apothecary. However, the dissolution of the monasteries from 1536 dramatically changed the availability of hospital in England. When Henry VIII split from the Catholic Church, he closed monasteries, convents, and confiscated their lands. This had a negative effect on hospital care. As most hospitals were attached to the church, very few were able to stay open and hundreds vanished around the country. Only St Bartholomew survived. As a result, smaller charity run hospitals sprung up with more of a focus on cure, not care. But 
It still took until the 1700s for numbers of hospitals to increase. There was another change in that specialist hospitals, called pest houses, grew. These focused on one disease, for example, the plague or smallpox. A big change was that previously the contagious were not allowed in hospitals, but now they were, and they were treated rather than just taken care of. The small spread of charity hospitals after the dissolution of monasteries wiped out many of the church-run hospitals. There was also continuation. Most sick people continued to be cared for at home or in the local community, as physicians remained too expensive. Women continued to play a role in the care of the sick. Even rich women, like Lady Grace of Mildway, who kept notes of her treatments. Overall, there was little significant change between periods. Renaissance healers, apothecaries and surgeons. They were still not given university training and were considered inferior to physicians, but they remained the cheaper alternative. They began to organize themselves into guild systems which meant they could train as apprentices for years until becoming a master surgeon or master apothecary. They both had to also have licenses to do their job. And practical experiences grew in this period with ongoing wars and new treatments, such as alchemy. Physicians, they continued to be trained at university, but they were taught new subjects such as anatomy due to discoveries by Vesalius and Sidonum. Trainees had access to a large selection of books due to the printing press. These contained detailed anatomical drawings to use. This encouraged doctors to slowly challenge traditions. However, most learning was done from books and there was little practice training, despite dissection now being legal. The Great Plague of 1665 London was an unhealthy place in the 17th century, with tightly packed streets, no sewage system and filthy water. As a result, the return of the plague in 1665 hit London hard. Ideas on the cause Most people believe the same things as they did during the Black Death in 1348. Therefore, there are a lot of similarities between the two epidemics, such as the belief in astrology. The alignment of Saturn and Jupiter in October 1664 was blamed, as well as the sight of a comet. There was also the belief that God had sent the plague as punishment. Also, miasma remained the most popular theory. The four humours became less popular but some still blamed an imbalance of the humours on the plague. There was a new idea, and this was passing it on. This was actually a correct theory, as the disease could be passed from person to person. They didn't know why, but as a result of this theory, victims were quarantined, even whole villages like Aum. Prevention. The most significant change came in attempts to prevent the plague. This time, people and the government made much more of an effort showing both similarity and difference in the prevention of the Black Death. Government action. Charles II and the government made more of an effort this time. Public meetings, fairs and large funerals were banned, whilst theatres were closed. Barrels of tar or sweet smelling herbs were burnt on newly clean streets to drive away the miasma. As well, over 40,000 dogs and 20,000 cats were slaughtered as they were blamed for spreading the disease. But this hindered the prevention of the plague as it was spread by rats and now there was no animals to kill them. The mayor appointed searchers and wardens looking for those with the disease. Households with it were marked with a red cross with Lord have mercy upon us written on it. They were quarantined for 28 days and the dead were collected daily. Advice from healers and physicians. 
The rich took advice from the College of Physicians and most people followed suggestions from local healers, such as carrying a pomander. This was a ball stuffed with perfumed items, which was used to ward away the miasma. There was also dieting and fasting or eating a diet of garlic. There was also prayer and repenting your sins. Plague water was sold by apothecaries, which included mint, rosemary, nutmeg and sugar. Also, smoking tobacco, a product of the new world, was encouraged to ward off my asthma. Others were told if you caught syphilis, a similar disease, it would prevent you from catching the plague. It did not. Treatment Many physicians actually fled to the countryside from London so they wouldn't get ill. Left in the physician's place were quack doctors. These were untrained but sold medical cures and advice. They were very popular and wore waxed cloaks with bird-shaped beak-like masks to attract the disease away. The masks were filled with sweet-smelling herbs to ward off the miasma. The treatments were similar to those used against the Black Death, but there were some new ideas. Bleeding and purging continued, but they also believed you could sweat out the disease by sitting by the fire. Herbal remedies, also known as great medicines, were common. For example, London treacle contained wine, herbs, spice, honey and opium, and was believed to cure you. A new idea was transference, so people strapped live chickens to bubos to transfer it to the bird. There was also prayer, which remained common, but no flagellants this time. People didn't understand the cause, so they couldn't treat it effectively, and the most common advice was to avoid catching it. The end. In part two, we'll be looking at key individuals like Sidonum and progress. Don't forget to like and subscribe.